Today is Monday, March 30th. I'm Jeremy Stovall, Professor of Civil Culture at Stephen F. Austin State University. This is our Week 10 Native Plant Center Lab uh, for Dendrology, our sophomore level course. And this is the third lab that I'm putting together this semester as we've moved all our courses online in response to coronavirus. We'll be learning 15 species this week, so I've split them across two screens here. I'll show you the second in a moment. Um, these are all native species. Uh, many of them are minor components of forest ecosystems in East Texas. Some of them are more major. We just haven't had the chance to see them on one of our lab sites yet. Uh, we'll learn two sumacs, which are small trees. Pawpaw is also a small tree. Uh, coral honeysuckle is a native honeysuckle. Arrowwood viburnum and swamp tai tai are both large shrubs. And southeastern coral bean is generally a small shrub. So this slide contains a lot of our small trees or shrubby species, all native. For the rest of our trees that you see here, uh, we have a number of really large trees here. Cherry bark oak can get absolutely enormous. Common native species across the southern coastal plain. Bitternut hickory and pecan both get very large, uh, as can big leaf magnolia. Uh, witch hazel and red buckeye and wax mallow are generally going to be small to medium to sometimes large sized shrubs. And American snowbell is generally going to be a small tree. So every species on the list this week is native. Our first species is winged sumac, Anacardiaceae rus copalinum, and we're going to see it is a very similar species to our next one, which is smooth sumac, Anacardiaceae rus glabra. Uh, the sumacs are native small trees to large shrubs. Uh, you typically find them about 20 feet tall or less. Uh, they have beautiful fall color, as you see here, red leaves, so they're, they're often used as ornamentals. Uh, and they're native and they're common all over the eastern United States. You can find winged sumac from East Texas to the Lake States, to the Northeast, to Florida. So it's a broadly distributed eastern species. If you have leaves, you'll have no trouble identifying winged sumac. It has pinnately compound alternate leaves. Winged sumac has several different common names that can help you identify it. Uh, another of its common names is shining sumac, and you see how these leaves are very shiny on top. That's where that name derives. In terms of it being winged sumac, I have a close-up shot here of the rachis you can look at, uh, and you'll see that the rachis there and even the petiole has a little bit of leaf coming off it. So that's your wing on winged sumac. I also want to draw your attention here to the margins of the leaflets. They are entire. If you have a smooth sumac that we'll look at in a moment, it has serrated margins to the leaflets. Now, if you have a poison sumac, it does also have those same entire margins, but poison sumac does not have the wing on the rachis. So that's how you tell our three native sumacs in the southern U.S. apart. We do have other native sumacs. We've learned fragrant sumac, but you're not going to confuse that with these. Another common name for winged sumac or shining sumac is speckled sumac, and that derives from the lenticels you see all over the large twig here. They do have relatively stout twigs, but what I want to draw your attention to here is the leaf scar and the bud, the lateral bud there. Uh, we're going to use a trick that's going to be very similar to what we use to discern green ash and white ash apart to tell winged sumac and smooth sumac apart in winter. So if the leaf scar does not almost completely encircle the lateral bud, you have a winged sumac. If the leaf scar almost completely encircles the lateral bud in the south, that's going to be a smooth sumac. So use that to tell them apart in winter. Otherwise, they're very, very similar species. Here you see the form of our winged sumac, and they generally don't have one main trunk. They don't have that X current form. They tend to have branching forms, so they tend to have a D current form. And what actually happens there, you can see the flowers at the end of each branch there. Here's a shot outside the growing season where you actually see the clusters of fruit now. The terminal buds tend to be flower buds that therefore become fruits. So the lateral buds in the subsequent growing season will take over vegetative growth, leading to a branching form. And so you have a very decurrent or branching form on all our sumacs, not one main trunk. When we look at these fruits here, uh, they are clustered there. They're red. It looks like an upside down cone. Here they've aged a little and gone more brownish. I'll show you in a moment on smooth sumac what they would look like when they're nice and bright red. Uh, wildlife will consume these, uh, birds, small mammals, so it's got some wildlife value. 
If you're walking through the woods and you find one of these sumacs fruiting, you can grab one of these off there when it's nice and bright red and suck on it. And it tastes a lot like pink lemonade, kind of sour. So people have used it to make teas and other things like that. It's popular as an ornamental, again, because of the fall color. Um, not a preferred browse or anything like that, but there are reports from the Ozarks where deer will browse on it in the winter when there's not much else around. Almost everything we just learned about wing sumac is also true for smooth sumac and a Cardiaceae rus glabra. The form is the same. These are both extremely shade intolerant species. You're not gonna find them in the middle of a closed canopy forest. They're both broadly distributed Eastern species. And while smooth sumac has a very similar Eastern range to wing sumac, it's also found in disjunct populations throughout Arizona, New Mexico, even up to Washington state and British Columbia. Uh, it's found in pinyon juniper ecosystems so it's a really interesting species in that it ranges all across the United States. Uh, smooth sumac has similar wildlife value. It's prized as an ornamental for its bright red fall foliage. People like eating the fruit. So all that's going to be similar to our winged sumac. Examining the leaves of smooth sumac, you'll notice that they're, again, pinnately compound with a terminal leaflet there, so odd pinnately compound. And here what you really notice is the bright red rachis and petiole. That would be the same thing that you would see on our poison sumac, but notice the serrated leaflet margins. Again, poison sumac does not have serrated leaflet margins. Winged sumac would have not serrated leaflet margins also, but it also has that winged petiole and winged rachis. So if you have leaves, they're very easy to tell apart. But even if you don't have leaves, in winter, you can still tell these apart because as you see here, the lateral bud is almost completely encircled by the leaf scar. And so this would be more similar to our white ash, whereas the winged sumac is more similar to our green ash. And so use that arrangement. If the leaf scar almost completely goes all the way around the lateral bud, it looks like a little tuft of cotton sticking out there, then you've got a smooth sumac in winter. Finally, I promised you a better shot of the cluster of droops, the fruit, and here you have it on a smooth sumac. This is going to look pretty much the same as what you would expect on a winged sumac. Uh, they have a little bit of tomentum on them. They're a little bit fuzzy, but again, this is the point where they're ripe. So you could pick these, you could suck on them, and they'd be real sour and tart and have generally a good flavor to them. Native Americans would use these to make hot and cold beverages, dyes. People use these currently to make different types of tea, and it's a great natural product. Uh, as with our winged sumac, these are also consumed by birds and other wildlife. So they do have wildlife value for all our native sumacs. Okay, next up we have pawpaw. I'm standing amongst a number of smaller pawpaws. Uh, this isn't generally going to be a smaller tree when they get big. You're still looking at a tree that's four to six inches DVH and 20 or 30 feet tall. So. Pawpaw will be found on mesic rich soils. So this is a species you're going to find on really good sites uh, that grow a lot of vegetation well. Uh, when we look at pawpaw right here, it's leaf off in late March in East Texas. Um, as you can see from this photo of a leaf flow, the leaves are about nine inches long. They can be pretty big. They're very distinctly obovate, and that ob part just means they're widest towards the apical half. Um, the really cool feature on pawpaw leaves, it's a confirmation feature. You crush up the leaf, you smell it, and most people think it smells like bell peppers, green peppers, something like that. So it does have a very distinct aroma to it. Um, in terms of identification right now, in the spring, these flowers are awesome. Uh, it is Anonaceae Asimina triloba, and the triloba is referring to the three petals here on the flower, um, and that's going to follow through with the fruit structure as well. They're very unique flowers though. You see they have this dark maroon petal on them, three of them. Uh, it doesn't look like any of our other forest trees we're learning this semester in lab. Um, as we look at this photo of a twig, uh, what you'll notice uh, is that you have a naked terminal bud that's gonna be rust colored. So it's a aggy A&M maroon color. We have another similar native species called dwarf pawpaw that we find on xeric sites, completely different site and they get about four or five feet tall. But when you look at the naked terminal buds on dwarf pawpaw, they'll be longhorn uh, UT burnt orange. So that's how you can tell the two species apart if you're not paying attention to the side around you. Um, these little buds kind of look like little artist paintbrushes, something like that. 
Smooth bark, you're usually not identifying pawpaw off the bark. Flowers are good, uh, the twigs are good, the leaves are very good. Uh, the other thing you want to use is the fruit. The Anonaceae family is the custard apple family. And so these fruits will look like kind of tiny little potatoes when they fruit out. Uh, but you open it up and it's got a very sweet custard-like fill. Uh, most times of year you can't find the fruit because they're not out, but once they do come out, once they do ripen, they disappear rapidly. People will collect them and eat them and wildlife will collect them and eat them. So you usually don't have them around for them. Hello and welcome to Tree Art. I am Bonnie Stovall. It has been several weeks since I've left the house because of the COVID-19 virus. But my love for tree art has continued. I've been able to do art with trees. I've looked at my canisters with trees on it. I've decorated with cones from trees. And I've read several books with tree titles and about trees. But sometimes you just feel like you need some different hobbies. Sometimes, I have to think of other things to do. There's no sports to watch. My family is always around. And sometimes I feel like I just need something for me. This is a native honeysuckle we have. This is coral honeysuckle. Um, sometimes it goes by trumpet honeysuckle as well. And it's in the Caprifoliaceae family like our other honeysuckles. And uh, this one is Lanicera sempervirens. So it's an evergreen honeysuckle. This is all over East Texas. You've probably seen it before, but you just didn't realize you see it until it flowers. And once it flowers, you start noticing, hey, there's, there's a uh, trumpet honeysuckle. Uh, as I look at it on this particular one right here, this one has these yellowish flowers. Um, when you see it out in the woods, you're gonna usually expect a red flower shaped the same as this. But the flowers are fantastic features. They're very long, they're very tubular. Um, out wild type, you'll have a red flower like you see in the picture. Um, and the red flower will have yellow inside the petals. And so that's a good identification feature for it. You don't need that if you find a honeysuckle and it doesn't have any flowers and you want to know if it's your Japanese honeysuckle or invasive species or your native uh, trumpet honeysuckle here. All you need to do is find the leaves, especially at the end of a vine. So it has opposite leaves, okay, Capricoliaceae, so it's opposite. But that's not the good ID feature. You go all the way out until you find the end of a vine. And what you'll notice is the last two opposite leaves fuse in their entirety around the stem. And so it's got one leaf completely encircling the stem is what it looks like. Nothing else we do this semester does that. That's a fantastic identification feature. Um, here you see it planted on an old post, a birdhouse up there on top, and it's being used as an ornamental here. I've seen it planted on trellises. You can get it growing on your mailbox. So it's a very popular native ornamental in the south. Um, you'll, you'll have it being used as a nectar species by insects, and those are going to be your main uses for our coral or trumpet honeysuckle, Capifoliaceae, Linus, or Cipermites. This is Arrowwood viburnum. Caprifoliaceae viburnum dentatum. So the common name and scientific name will really help you remember this species. Uh, dentatum is referring to the dentate margins on this leaf where you can see uh, the pointed tips pointing out, so it's dentate. Uh, it's called arrowwood viburnum. The leaves are generally shaped like an arrow shape, so that's gonna help you. Um, and another reason it's called arrowwood viburnum, you can see in some places on this particular tree, or shrub really, more than tree, um, it will have very straight limbs. So if we put one of these off, you can see how nice and straight that is. And uh, they used to use these straight limbs to make arrow shafts with. So arrowwood viburnum, there you go. This is a really big one. Uh, it's been planted here, it's been watered, it's been irrigated. If you put it in your yard, it's a great huge native shrub as an ornamental. They have very showy flowers on them in late spring around May to June. And uh, then they'll have fruits, clusters of bluish black droops, like you see on any viburnum. Um, in terms of identification out in the woods, expect them to be smaller. Expect the leaves to generally have some tomentum or fuzz on them. And then as a viburnum, you remember it's in the Capricoliaceae family. They do have the opposite leaf arrangement. And so that's gonna be another helpful identification feature. 
This is a common native shrub from East Texas further east along the Gulf Coastal Plain. Uh, it's native. It's going to have some wildlife value from a mass production standpoint, uh, and it's a good ornament. This is a swamp tie tie. You have to be very careful how you pronounce that common name. That is the correct pronunciation, tie tie. Uh, this is in the Cyrillaceae family, only member of that family we're doing this semester. This is Cyrilla racema flora. So a raceme is a long linear cluster of flowers. And so if I look at this, these are last year's racemes, the remnants of them still on here. And so this would have been the central stalk. You can see the fruit still attached to that in a few places. Uh, but this thing's going to leaf out here in a few months. Again, it's late March right now. It's going to leaf, or sorry, not leaf out. It's going to flower, and you'll have these long racemes of showy white flowers. Um, when you look at swamp tai tai, the form is a shrub to a small tree, but usually a shrub. Uh, it will often branch a lot from the base like this one, so spreading a, a form similar to what we would expect on wax myrtle. Usually students in Dendro have trouble identifying this because it's a shrub and if you look at a leaf on it, it looks like a willow oak leaf. There's not much to that to identify it. It's, it's narrow, it has entire margins. It feels kind of thick, but it's not fully evergreen. And so the leaves aren't very obvious. So students have trouble identifying it. There are some pretty easy features you can use to identify it. So if you get yourself a twig and you break it off and you take this twig and you roll it in your fingers, what you'll notice is that the twig is actually triangular in cross-section. So that's a really odd feature. Most stuff we're seeing this semester won't have triangular twigs. And triangles are another good thing to remember because if I look up close at it and I look at my leaf scar here, what I'll notice on my leaf scar is it's very triangular in shape as well. So for swamp tie tie, you really want to remember triangular twigs and that's going to help you identify it. Uh, we're here in Nacogdoches County here and further north. I don't often see very much swamp tai tai, but as you move south of us, and especially when you get into the lower coastal plain, you'll see a lot of it in roadside ditches and other very mesic to hydric areas. Sometimes you have to come up with a hobby with the ones that you truly love. Southeastern coral bean, Fabaceae erythrina herbacea, is a shrub. Often it can be a small tree sometimes, typically maxing out at about 20 feet in height. Um, it's native to the coastal plain of the southern U.S., so it ranges from East Texas to Florida, and it'll even range down into Mexico. Um, with southeastern coral bean, you'll find it sometimes out in the middle of a stand, but it really grows best in partial shade at the edge or even in full sun. I've seen them in growing in Louisiana as, you know, large shrubs about 10 feet tall near reservoirs, for example. Identification is easy provided you avoid one common mistake. Students will look at this and very quickly they'll write down Chinese tallow on a quiz sheet and you can see why. Uh, the lobing on these leaflets and the long acuminate tip, this shape is generally very similar to our uh, Chinese tallow tree, Triatica sebifera. But if you'll notice, this is a trifoliate leaf. Tallow is simple, this is compound, so that's one good difference. Another good difference will be the prickles that you find all over southeastern coral bean. They can be on the petiole, the rachis, they can be on the stem. They're small recurve prickles, kind of reminiscent of rubus, or our blackberries. Uh, and tallow doesn't have any prickles on it, so it's another good way to tell that you don't, in fact, have a Chinese tallow. Southeastern coral bean is a popular native ornamental. It'll get these racemes on it that'll be two feet long with these really showy red flowers on them. 
So people often like it in the landscape. You put it in your yard if you're preferring native species. And this one's real pretty. It'll tend to flower April to June or so. So typical sort of spring flowering schedule in East Texas. Once the flowers are fertilized and they go to fruit, the legumes are also kind of attractive. Uh, they're constricted between the seeds, so it gives them kind of a pearl necklace appearance. And then the seeds start coming out, and the seeds are bright red. So people like the fruits on these as well. The flowers will uh, serve for birds and insects, so there's some wildlife value there. And of course, the legumes serve as a mast as well. But primarily, the use for this species is going to be as a native ornamental in your yard. Now, the specific epithet is herbacea. What you will notice in many places in East Texas, this may die back to ground line over the winter. Once the shrubs get larger, low, they, they are perennial, so it isn't going to die back to ground line. This is a cherry bark oak, Fagaceae Quercus pagoda. One of the most important things to know about cherry bark oak is it used to be Quercus falcata variety pagodifolia. So it used to be thought of as just a variety of southern red oak. It's going to be a very similar tree to Quercus falcata, except you tend to find cherry bark oak on more mesic sites. So it's going to be a wetter sited species than southern red oak. It's called cherry bark oak, so start with the bark, right? As we look at the bark here, what you'll notice for an oak, it's got a lot of small scales. Okay, so we see all these small scales here. Doesn't look exactly like black cherry, but looks pretty close. That's why it's cherry bark oak. Here's a younger cherry bark oak, smaller diameter, and you can see the bark's very smooth right here. And then it, you know, when it's this size, it really looks like black cherry bark a lot, the, the flakiness to it. Cherry bark oak can get quite large, as you see on this tree here. Uh, so this tree is several feet in dbh. And as we look at the bark, you can see it still has those cherry bark-like scales on it, but they've gotten larger and rougher on a tree of this size, is, is what you would expect. Let me tell you a story about Lockhart, Brian Roy Lockhart. Man loved oak, man loved cherry bark oak. Man loved everything about cherry bark oak. Man loved the leaves, man loved the trunk. Man loved hugging the trunk. Man loved cherry bark oak. Man born in Arkansas, man went to Yale. Man went to Mississippi to learn everything about cherry bark oak. Man worked for the government. Man loved cherry bark oak. Man think he Indiana Jones. You think he Indiana Jones? That's the mystery of the Lockhart. On cherry bark oak, the leaves are a great ID feature. And so we have some examples right here. And so you can tell it's in the red oak group. It has these bristle tips ons at the end of the lobes. But what you want to use on a cherry bark oak leaf, if this was southern red oak, it would have a very bell-shaped, rounded base to it. This has a straighter base on cherry bark oak. And then cherry bark oak is Quercus pagoda. So pagoda is referring to the Japanese castle-like pagoda shape on the lobing of the leaves here. So you'll see it on that one. I can show you some more examples here. Here's another good one where you have that pagoda-like form in there. You can see how some of these leaves are falcate, how they curve. And that's going to be a similarity with southern oak. Uh, acorns are going to be pretty similar to southern red oak. The, the twigs are going to have clustered terminal buds like all oaks, large, red, five-sided. So that's going to be very similar to southern red oak. Cherry, cherry bark oak is a very high-value timber species. It's one of the most prized timber species in the southern U.S. It's managed a lot, uh, particularly grown with sweet gum. And the idea there is sweet gum serves as a nurse tree or a buddy tree. You grow both of them together. The sweet gum will outcompete cherry bark oak for about 20, 25 years. And as it outcompetes it, cherry bark oak has to grow one main straight trunk like this tree here. It has good form, it self prunes well, and then it eventually, in 20 years, outtops the sweet gum, grows very large in size, and you have great saw timber quality logs on cherry bark oak. It's a red oak, so you have good wildlife value on them as well. And this is uh, a popular oak to be planted in urban landscapes, probably not to the same extent as Schumard oak. Uh, but it is one species that is commonly planted. Cherry bark oak is broadly distributed along the southern coastal plain. It is a southern species. Uh, it'll, it'll range up the Mississippi Alluvial Valley. I've seen it planted in southern Indiana and it grows quite well there. Uh, and it is restricted primarily to bottomland habitat types. This is a witch hazel, Hamamelidaceae hamamelis virginiana. Uh, witch hazel is basically a very large shrub. Think of it like cleaner tree in terms of form. So it always has this spreading form that you see on this one here. 
Witch Hazel's native from here in East Texas all the way up the Appalachian Mountains uh, into the northeastern United States. Uh, so it can handle some pretty cold habitats. It actually flowers in winter, small yellow flowers, and then those will go and form fruits that are capsules. They look like small urns or vases. Uh, and it's pretty interesting. They build up turgor pressure and then they'll burst open and shoot the seed like a pop. -up. So that's how they disperse their seeds away from the mother tree so the new plant has a chance to survive. Uh, they're very easy to identify. Uh, when we look at the leaves, uh, they all have these wavy, irregular margins. Um, they're generally round in shape. You can see a lot of variability low. Um, they often have an acuminate tip, but not always. So variability to them, but they follow a similar enough pattern you can easily get an eye for. Them. Um, when you look at the twigs on Witch Hazel, uh, the terminal buds are going to be a good helpful feature. They look, when you turn them upside down, it's kind of a stalked naked terminal bud, so it looks like a little deer hoof when you turn them upside down, so that's a good ID feature. When we look at this tree here and you look at the angles of the branches and how they form all these V shapes, uh, when we look at the form of this witch hazel, you'll notice all the branches form these distinct V shapes, and so that's what I'm going to air quote as a use of witch hazel. So you break this branch off about up here, you've got this V-shaped stick, and then you take it and it'll lead you to your lost wallet, gold, water, oil. So it's used as a divining rod to find things. So that's a use of witch hazel. Uh, more realistic use of witch hazel, you could go into Walmart during a normal time, maybe not in the midst of a pandemic, uh, and you could go onto the cosmetics aisle and you could find witch hazel oil. Uh, it's used as an astringent to dry skin out. And so that's an actual product that people will make from this. What a beautiful day for a dog show. I'm Dennis. And I'm Diane. And we're here in a COVID dog show. Oh, look at our first beast. Isn't she amazing? Look at those flanks. Look at those teeth. Such clean teeth and healthy ears. What a wonderful doggy. She sure is imposing, though. Oh, look at her. Oh, here's our next competitor. What a fine haunch. That is a good pose. Uh, so still, so compliant. Oh, underneath is good, and look at that tail dangle. Well, cheese and crackers, that's a good one. Oh, here goes our first competitor. This, oh, she put it in her mouth. Oh, this is very bad. Why is she going through the course herself? She went through the tunnel with the dog treat in her mouth, but it worked. Oh, no. Oh, no. She knocked Penalty. in her coat. Points, points. Penalty. Oh, this dog is not complying. This dog is not complying at all. Oh, no. No. Penalty. Oh, like the dog's going to jump. Or go up this ramp. It's not happening today. Oh, Whoa. disappointing show. Disappointing show for our first contestant. All right, where well, our venue is still beautiful. Let's see what we have up next. Oh, he's going through the tunnel. This is quick. This is quick. Through the slalom. Through the slalom. Effortless. Very little guidance. Over the jump. Fantastic. What speed? What a fantastic and competitor. And he stuck the landing. What Look a at fine that. show. Fine show. Amazing. This is a red buckeye. It's got quite the scientific name on it. Hippocastanaceae aesculus pavia. And when you look at red buckeye, uh, this is why it's called red buckeye. It has red flowers. So people like it as a ornamental. These flowers are very showy. And they'll be on here. This is one of the very first things to leaf out in the spring. Here we are in late March. This probably leafed out a month ago. So it's one of the first things to leaf out, but it's also one of the first things to lose its leaves. Uh, the leaves will tend to drop in a bad drought year and even late July. And so it's asynchronous with a lot of the overstory trees leafing out, so it gets to start photosynthesizing before they leaf out, which is important because it is an understory species. This would be a pretty big one out in the woods. This is kind of a typical size when you see them in the forest. Uh, you'll often see them smaller than this, and they don't look this full. They often don't have this many leaves. They have sparser foliage, more spread out in the shade. Um, I have seen them planted in people's yards where, again, they get irrigated, they get fertilized. And you'll see them 15 feet tall, huge, big, wide, spreading shrubs. So it is a, a good native ornamental, uh, as are many species we're doing this week. Even if you don't have these showy red, pink flowers, identification is extremely easy. You can see right here, the leaf arrangement is opposite. Mad Cat Big Hippo, this is the hippo, Hippo Castanese in that acronym. So it's got this opposite leaf arrangement, but then that's one leaf. It has palmately compound leaves. And so opposite palmately compound, we really don't have anything else this semester that's doing that. 
you know that you've got a buckeye, and around here it's going to be a red buckeye. There are other species in the Appalachians, in the central hardwoods region, but in East Texas it's going to be red buckeye. Now as we look at this palmately compound leaf up a little bit closer, you'll notice very parallel venation, serrated margins on the leaflets, and it's a very dark green colored leaf. Uh, you can see that, it's a deep dark green. The twigs are also an excellent identification feature, mostly because it's opposite and compounds, so they're very stout twigs. So here you see a good example where the opposite buds at the end of the twig are very obvious. This is a good example, but very commonly you'll see it where one of the buds will have broken off or one will be significantly larger than the other, so don't let that throw you off either. The other odd thing about these big terminal buds, that they're large, but when you point the tip of it right at your eye like this, they generally appear to be square in cross-section, or as you see in this photo, a square rotated, so we'll call it a diamond. In the fall, you'll see red buckeye fruiting. The fruits look like small potatoes, lumpy, tan potatoes stuck on the tree. They're actually capsules, uh, and when the capsule opens, they'll often fall off on the ground, they'll open, and you'll see that they have usually one to three seeds inside. These seeds are what they call buckeyes. You can see on the top one there in this cluster that it's dark brown in color, chestnut brown in color, but it has the lighter parts. So that's the eye of the buck. The most important thing to know about these is that they are toxic to people. You should not eat these, so don't eat buckeyes. Nonetheless, people will often carry them in their pocket as a sign of good luck. So the fruits are an excellent identification feature as well. Red buckeye is native to central Texas. It's native to East Texas, up the lower Mississippi alluvial valley into Missouri, and it's native all the way east to the Atlantic Ocean along the southern coastal plain and Piedmont regions. And its primary use is some wildlife can consume the, the fruit despite it being toxic to people. Um, it's a great ornamental, so people really prize this as an ornamental. This is a bitternut hickory, Juglund ACE caria cordiformis. Next week we will be learning our nutmeg hickory. Um, and nutmeg hickory has some similar traits to bitternut hickory, but the important distinction between the two is bitternut hickory is fairly common, and nutmeg hickory is probably the rarest tree we will learn all semester. So if you're confused between the two, you're 99% of the time gonna be looking at a bitternut hickory. Uh, and the really cool feature that lets you easily ID even a very large bitternut hickory, like this tree here, uh, that's about 16 inches DBH, and probably 80 feet tall. You have the diamond shaped pattern on the bark. So you can see the diamonds in here, very noticeably diamond shaped patterns, the anastomosing bark we've discussed. But look how smooth it is. On any other hickory we're learning this semester other than nutmeg hickory, a tree this size would have much, much rougher bark. Uh, beyond the smoothness to it, what you want to do is look down in the little fissures between the ridges. The ridges will be gray or whitish on top. But you look down between them and it's kind of pink and salmon colored. And so that's going to be a really good way to identify a large bitternut hickory. Uh, beyond the, the stem, which is a great feature, uh, you see here a bud. The buds are naked and sulfur yellow. Occasionally they'll be more brown, but often they're this very obvious sulfur yellow, yellow color. So use the buds. Um, you can use the leaves if you want. They'll have more leaflets than shagbark for sure, typically more leaflets than mocker nut. Uh, so, as you can see in this photo here, you're looking at 9, 11 leaflets more commonly. Uh, so the leaves are helpful. The nut has a thin husk on it. When you peel open the husk, uh, what you find is a nut with a crinkly, wrinkled coating on it, uh, surface to it. it. It looks like a brain. And this is bitter nut hickory for a reason. The nuts are bitter, uh, lesser usage for different wildlife species. So it's, it's not a preferred hickory. All the other hickory uses are going to be similar. Uh, wood for charcoal for barbecue. Um, some of the hickories are very popular for flooring, tool handles, other products. Some are not, depending on whether they get ring shake or not. Uh, but similar uses for the most part among all the hickories. And like shag bark and other hickories, this is one component of a mixed mesophytic forest. So it's native, you'll find it as, you know, 10% or less of the basal area or the trees per acre uh, in a bottomland hardwood stand that probably has 40 or more uh, different woody species. Uh, Bitternut hickory is native all across the southern coastal plain, uh, relatively common. Welcome back to the dog show. I'm Diane and I'm here with Dennis. Hi, I'm Dennis. We are about to receive the awards for the dog show. As you can see, we had some great competitors today. 
Look at this doggy! We've never even seen him before, but it looks like he made an impression with the judges. And look at this doggy! He's fantastic! We remember his fantastic run through the slalom. Just amazing. They're doing the awards. Oh my goodness, second place to that doggy! Whoever that doggy is. And first place to this fantastic doggy! He did fantastic, and did you see the flanks on that one? Look at our winners here together! Oh, there's a loser doggy! What is she doing here? What a sad loser doggy! She did not do well. I wonder how this loser doggy is handling this level of rejection. And I wonder what her handler thinks. Pecan is the state tree of Texas. Pecan is actually a hickory, despite the common name. Um, sometimes it goes by sweet pecan, sometimes it goes by pecan hickory, but usually just pecan. Uh, if you ever meet someone from South Carolina and they're talking about a pecan, it's the same tree. In terms of the native range, pecan covers much of central and eastern Texas, and then it really ranges east to the Mississippi River, and it's just found in the Mississippi Alluvial Valley on the east side of the river, but not much further east within its actual native range. Um, it ranges as far north as Indiana, Illinois, and Missouri, but it has been planted east of its native range pretty widely, so you will find it east all the way to the Atlantic. Just know that that's not within its native range. Pecan is a large bottomland hardwood species that can live for hundreds of years. It's generally intolerant of shade, and it has a wide variety of uses. Here you see an orchard where pecan is planted to produce nuts. It's been in cultivation for decades. And so if you look at the fruit on pecan, what it's typically most valued for, you see here it has a nut that's born within an involucra of bracts from the flower. And so those green scales will dry and peel back. If you're actually in a pecan orchard, you often have equipment like this uh, that you'll see shaking the tree to cause the nuts to fall, typically in November or December. Time to shake the pecans. Here you see the husk drying down from the green to black often before it peels off, revealing the nut inside. These are long and tubular. Remember, this is easy to confuse with water hickory. But as you see in this big pile of pecans, they're kind of shaped like hot dogs, whereas water hickory would be shaped like a hamburger patty squashed flat. And then finally, you crack open the very thin husks. Even kids can do it with their bare hands usually. And you can see the pecan here that's used in pies and all sorts of other products. So it's very commonly cultivated throughout Texas and throughout the South for its nuts. Leaf identification is also easy. It has more leaflets than we've seen on any other hickory. So in this particular example here, you can see it easily has about 13 leaflets. They're all similar in size. They're very curved or falcate. And this is going to be classic for pecan. The buds are also easy to identify. The thing you're most likely to confuse them with will be black walnut when black walnut is young. Uh, they're whitish in color. They have dense pubescence on them on relatively stout twigs. The leaf scars will also be reminiscent of any of the hickories, really, also black walnut, where it's the large owl or monkey face shape uh, that you see on this branch here. Bark begins smooth and light in color. And as they get larger, the bark will sometimes show some anastomosing pattern like many of the hickories. But when they get big enough, it really just breaks up into scaly or platy bark. Pecan is typically one of the later species to flower and then leaf out. Um, often it'll flower right before leaf out. And the flowers are long, pendulous catkins like you see here. And so expect that in some years, even mid to late April, early May. It can be pretty late. Form-wise, unless it's grown in an intact, highly dense stand, you're, you're going to get a branching, wide canopy on this pecan here. And I got this shot in our very own pecan park right here in Nagadocious, Texas. Uh, our park is formerly a pecan orchard. Now it has playgrounds, a frisbee golf course, and some walking trails. Here's a small pecan that they've planted in the park to try and regenerate it as some of the older ones end up dying. Uh, we haven't really talked about timber value of pecan, but that's also excellent. It's used for flooring, furniture, all sorts of products like that. Uh, it's also a very popular tree as an ornamental tree. People will plant it in their yard as a shade tree. And like all hickories, the limbs are very flexible and difficult to break. Uh, so you may see drooping limbs on these that you know really flex a lot. If you prune it poorly, they may break off at those joints, but otherwise the branches are pretty difficult to break. 
Um, people will typically plant them in their yard for aesthetics, but then come November, you can probably walk around your yard, uh, collect the sweet pecans, and there you go. You've got a snack as well. So this is a, a smaller big leaf magnolia, Magnolia ACE Magnolia Macrophylla, macro big, fill a leaf. As you can see in this picture, the leaf's quite large. Uh, they can easily be two feet in length. Uh, so, you know, you could make an umbrella out of these things. They're huge. Uh, they have really auriculate leaf bases that you see at the bottom there. So it looks like they've got a couple ear lobes on the leaf base. They're one of our largest simple leaves that we'll see all semester. We have bigger leaves, but they're all usually compound, tripinately compound. Okay, um, when we look away from the leaf, which is by far your best ID feature, there's other easy features on it. It is a deciduous magnolia, and when you look at the magnolias, the buds are often distinct. We're not used to looking at them because we're so used to southern magnolia, which is evergreen. You don't need the buds. But here we see a very large, very silver terminal bud on this big leaf magnolia right here. Right over here with this fresh opening bud, we see another good identification feature. And so what you see is this bud is breaking, but you can see how it was all silver and fuzzy. It started to green up a little bit. But what you'll notice is this first leaf See how the petiole is fused to the bud? That's a weird thing that you can see easily here on magnolias, and it's, it's a great ID feature. So, big leaf magnolia does that, like you needed more features. Uh, this is gonna have showy white flowers, not too dissimilar from southern magnolia. It's gonna have slightly smaller uh, aggregates of follicles, and so it's the fruit where it looks like a little bitty hand grenade or something, the red seeds fall out, and so those are all gonna be good identification features. Big leaf magnolia is native in the southern U.S. You really don't start picking much of it up in East Texas. You start finding a lot more once you get over into Louisiana. So that's why we're doing it here in the Native Plant Center. We just haven't seen it on any of our other lab locations yet. Wax mallow, which some of you may know as Turk's cap, is our next native species. It's in the Malvaceae family, Malvaviscus arboreus, and for Turk's cap, that's actually variety Drummondii. So if you know Turk's cap, you already know wax mallow. This is a native species, not incredibly common, but it is a popular ornamental. Um, it only gets waist to shoulder height, typically, and often dies back to the ground each year. So it is a perennial species but it can get killed back if you have weather that's too cold. Here you see the flower. This is why it's so popular. They have these beautiful flowers with a fused corolla. So the corolla is all the petals combined. And so the petals form this ornamental world shape with the stamens sticking out. So very pretty flowers. Sometimes they'll be red like this. Sometimes they'll be more pink. Uh, those flowers then, of course, are pollinated, fertilized, they fruit. Uh, here you see one of the fruits that's white. It hasn't fully ripened yet, but they'll often go red when they ripen. Looks like a tiny tomato, and it has a sweet taste to them. People do sometimes eat them a, a little bit if you have it growing in your garden. You see the leaf below it here. Here's another leaf. Maybe on a bad day you can fuse this with a maple, but it really is a pretty easy leaf to identify. Not very much out there you're going to confuse it with. If you do think it looks maple-like, well, know that this is alternate whereas the maples are opposite. Uh, it can get, you know, half an inch or so in diameter. Here you see the stem. But really the take-home message here on wax mallow is it's a good ornamental. It's showy. You'll find it out in the woods occasionally in East Texas. This is an American snowbell. Uh, this is in the Styracaceae family, Styrex americanus. We've learned two-wing silverbell. It's related to American snowbell. Uh, probably the most important thing to know about snowbell is it is a rare tree. You don't see these very often. Uh, when you do, you're really usually pretty excited. It's, it's a nice small tree. It's a good ornamental. So people that like native ornamentals, this is a popular choice. And you see why this time of year. They have these pretty bell-shaped whitish flowers, and that gives it that name, snowbell. Um, in terms of identification, that's good. The twigs are great. 
Uh, when we look at the twigs on a snowbell, you can see they're zigzagged here, but they're also covered in a dense tomentum, so they're going to be very fuzzy. That's going to be a real helpful ID feature. You really, you don't look at snowbell buds very much. The buds are small, you know, not much there. And so you're looking for a zigzag twig with small buds that's very fuzzy. Most other zigzag twigs with small buds aren't as toment, uh, don't have the tomentum on them. Um, in terms of the leaves, like two-wing silverbell, they're relatively round. They have an irregularly wavy margin. Uh, but unlike two-wing silverbell, they're going to be very white and fuzzy on the back. So more tomentum, that's kind of the theme on this species. Uh, the bark is going to be smooth. You can see the trunk might remind you of a Carpinus caroliniana. So it might remind you of our hornbeam, where it's fluted and muscly a little bit. But the leaves are wrong, the fruit's wrong, the twigs are wrong. So hopefully you won't make that mistake. Um, the other thing that we can't see right now that is fuzzy on these is the fruit. Um, they are going to have a small droop, and that small droop will be whitish in color, covered in a dense white tomentum. So not common, native, it's a good small tree in an urban landscape if you want to go with natives. No timber value, maybe a little bit of wild. It's American Snowball. Sometimes our hobbies don't work out, even when we have all the time in the world to practice them. It's kind of like our life streams. Anyway, welcome back to Tree Art. I'm Bonnie Stovall. Today, not only will we be looking at Tree Art, but we will be making some. Taking your dog for a walk? Oh, Bonnie, you stepped in something. Oh, oh, how foul. Oh, oh, she's gonna pick it up. She's gonna pick it up. Oh, no, no. Dad, stop taking pictures of those trees. Bad, bad.